Hey everyone, I'm about to show you my number one trick for controlling magical effects. So I've got a very basic setup here just with some points inside of a sphere and then I'm also doing a volume version so we can kind of test this technique on both points and volumes. Uh, then I have a tube which I'm using as a as a collider just to you know have some extra interest and, and uh, something to kind of play with and then I've got a curve that I've drawn, which I am turning into a velocity field. Well, in fact, the field is called V, and we basically want the the points or the, the voxels to basically move along this, this curve. But I will say straight away that it's not just about curve forces. It's also, you could have this be um, noise, um, velocities from a character there's there's lots of ways we can come to these velocity fields not just through curves um, and i wanted to create sort of a more holistic approach right now you may think straight away that the best way to do this is pop it back by volumes and although this does work and there is some benefit to it it has some problems i'm going to show you exactly what those problems are so i'm referring to my second input because that's where my uh, target field is plugged in and it's called V so we add that in and when I hit play you'll notice a couple of things so number one it's not very accurate it's not following that curve well enough uh, and also it's decelerating it's actually slower than it was uh, even straight away from the very beginning it's slower than it was if uh, when this was um, not plugged in okay so you'll see there it falls a lot faster we plug it in it slows down and if we increase the air resist which is basically the blend or like the the weight right saying how much how strong this influence of this target uh, velocity should be uh, then it decelerates even more yes now it's more accurate once it hits the point of the curve but outside of our field there are zero values right and it's not detecting that, okay, I'm outside the field, so I should do nothing. Instead, it just treats it as a zero, and it's blending towards that zero. So the stronger we get, like let's increase our air resist now to 100, it's going to decelerate massively. Okay, so this is problematic. Also, pop it back by volumes using air resist. Uh, the limitation of this is that it really has only one value, but I want a little bit more control. So I'm going to show you something else that comes, I think, a little bit closer to the results that I would like, which is only available at uh, volume, right? So it's a volume source node rather than the, um, it, you know, we can't apply this to particles. But if we use a volume source, you point to our second context geometry, refer to a, a vector field. Our vector field is called V and we're targeting the VEL field. So we're overriding the VEL field. Now, add uh, obviously does a really good job of applying a force, but uh, it is additive. So it ends up being incrementally additive to certain voxels that don't move fast enough. If they're still within that field, then they get more velocity added to them. This is particularly bad. I mean, here you can see it's over, overshooting massively, but it's also particularly worse with something where you've got a huge field, um, like a, let's say a wind or a noise, because then it is just constantly adding. So everything is accelerating all the time and that's not great, okay? But we do have a much more powerful option here in pull. So pull is essentially blending towards that target velocity, similar to how um, an air resist, so a wind force would. But what's really cool with it is it lets us separate acceleration and deceleration. What these two are is, so if your current velocity compared to the target velocity if the target velocity is faster than the current then it looks at the acceleration strength value if the target velocity is lower than the current velocity in terms of speed right so the length of that vector then it uses the deceleration strength and those two being separate is really really powerful it lets us do a whole lot of things now of course if we just keep the two values the same, then it acts the same as the air resist on a wind force would. 
or like a, um, I keep saying wind force, but a pop advect by volumes is a wind force. Wind is a style where it is a blend rather than it being additive, right? So just so you know, that's what I mean when I say a wind force. Pop advect by volumes is one of those wind forces. Um, so here we have two separate values. We can keep them the same and then of course it acts like a, a wind force, but we can separate them. So in our example here, if I keep this value um, quite low, then it's gently going to try and nudge it to follow that. But obviously with all the turbulence and everything going on in, a, in, a, uh, in this pyro, it's not going to really show a very magical result. Now, I could increase this so that we get a much more um, control from that, uh, that curve. But again, it's now doing that, that same problem of slowing down our um, gravity because it's finding zero values and then it's decelerating towards those values. But because acceleration and deceleration are separate, what I could do is take deceleration down. So now in values where it, or in areas where it finds a zero value, so outside of our actual um, target velocity field, it finds a zero and says, well, you are slower than my current velocity. So I am going to blend towards you using this weight and the weight is zero. So in other words, don't do any blending. In this case, then gravity is not limited. Let me, sorry, let me just reset that properly. So it falls at the appropriate speed. Then it starts hitting our, um, our target velocity field. But here there's a problem as well that our target velocity field might be slow so it might you know gravity might be faster than actually our target velocity what if we want the you know there's a wizard controlling some you know smoke or fire and they're very delicately having it change shape and follow a certain curve or something like that so you want to overwhelm the normal forces like gravity or some other you know maybe turbulence or whatever but you want to overwhelm it with a force that is very slow and gentle, right? So you want the weight to be high so that it can overwhelm any other forces, but you, the actual value is low, um, you know, so the length of that vector is very low, which means it would fall into this deceleration strength, okay? So the acceleration strength is not really going to help if our, you know, our target velocity field is very um, low in terms of speed, right? because then it's actually looking at this deceleration value and saying, well, you should have zero, so therefore don't follow that curve at all because a curve is slower than my just normal gravity. All right, so that doesn't really help us. But we also have direction, and this is something really nice with pull is that it lets us separate direction. So now, once this is turned on, acceleration and deceleration only are used to blend the speed itself. They don't change the direction, so they're not saying, right, the target velocity is faster than my current velocity, so I use this weight to then blend my velocity to that velocity. In other words, magnitude and direction of that vector, and the whole thing shifts. Instead, it now only looks at the speed and uses these two weights, acceleration and deceleration, to change the speed of the current velocity. And then separately, it uses this weight to control direction. So now what we could do is we don't even need acceleration or deceleration at all because we're saying, look, I don't actually need you to match the speed, but I want you to um, just change your direction. Okay. And then when it enters that area, it's going to try and alter the direction. Obviously, we can increase that strength so it has a much stronger effect of controlling the direction of our our volume uh, but of course it's not influencing the speed at all if we wanted to influence the speed though now that is a problem because again we now have to start increasing the deceleration strength so let's say this, vo this volume is falling and then it hits a point where this magical you know wizard kind of controls it and it decelerates and moves sideways well we can't have a decelerate because otherwise it will decelerate everywhere because there's zero values outside of our velocity field. So again, there's a problem, okay? This, this problem comes up again and again, no matter what you try and do. Even with this uh, like pop it vector by volumes, one of the biggest problems 
uh, sorry, well, I deleted it already, but one of the biggest problems is you see something follows this curve force and then a point just slightly overshoots. And as soon as it does, it just stops in midair because it's le exiting the field. It finds that its target then in that area is sampling a zero value. And it because you've got maybe a high air resist, it just instantly dies. Like it just stops moving and just sticks in midair. Not a good result. Okay, so after discussing all of that, let's decide on what our solution is. And the solution is basically, I like the strength and the kind of control that pull gives me, but using just the volume source to do pull is not good enough. There's still something missing. Also, I don't like that it is not really available as an option on particles. So how do we solve this? Well, VEX, right? <laughs> if you know me, it's, the solution is always VEX, right? But this is one where I'm going to say, like, even for those of you who are maybe not as technical, not that comfortable with VEX, this is a real good reason why you should use VEX. A real good reason to get more familiar with it, or at the very least, just tolerate it. You know what I mean? Um, use it where it's necessary. And this is one of those scenarios where it really is necessary. I'm going to show you how to build the code. It, it looks like a lot. It's a lot of lines of code, but it's actually so simple. It's, it's lots of very, very basic lines that add up to a very, very simple mathematical equation that what we're basically doing is we're going to rebuild the pull function that's happening in the volume source, but we're going to do it in a way that can be applied to points and volumes and that gives us extra control. You could even just copy this code and reuse it so you don't even have to be good at VEX, although if you want to be an effects artist, really, you you know, you need to get more familiar with your VEX. And you, that's not saying you have to write everything in VEX like I do, like I really just prefer doing everything in VEX. You don't have to go as extreme as that. But this is a scenario where I'm really, I'm trying to convince you that this is the, the absolute power of VEX is when you want something custom and controllable. Because if it's there in code, then you can alter lines of code, disable lines, add a little multiplier, add, it's so customizable when the code is exposed. Whereas now in the volume source, I'm looking at it going, cool, well, this is doing 90% of the work that I wanted to do, but that little 10%, I just it needs something else and I can't alter it, all right? It's, I have to try and fiddle with it or start having extra fields that are used as masks and trying to, and it just becomes so complicated where in VEX, it would be one line. So sure, it might take a long time to like a bit more work to write those lines of code initially. Later down the line, it's much less work to just add a single line that says, oh, if this condition is met, then ignore the, the field or whatever. And then we can control it to our heart's desire. Okay, so in order to understand how we're gonna build this pull function, I wanna talk about averaging and then what a weighted average is. So we're gonna break this down into a really simple concept here. I have two points, okay? Let's um, get rid of our curve. So I've got two points, point one, point two, all right? And I've given them two different colors so we can see them, right? These are also just, they are packed, right? So they really are just, although it's, you know, got the words and the sphere, it's basically two points, okay? Now, if I have a, a tube, here, right? So that's my second object. Well, it's my other object. Let me expose them all. If I average the position between these two, it's going to put this cone exactly halfway between them. All right. So how I'm doing that is I am fetching the position of each of those points, right? And then my current position. So here's the mathematical equation to do an average between two values is you add the two values together and you divide by two. Now, why do we divide by two? It's because there are two values. If we were averaging uh, just a linear average like this between three values, we would add all three and we would divide by three, right? Because it's one per value. So, you know, it's, it's a tree, they've got a weight of one and that weight is unaltered. So they all have an equal weight. So in this case, each of them counts as one value. So we add them together and divide by two. I'm sure this is very simple. Everyone 
most people know how to do an average, which is, you know, add them together and divide by two. But to break that concept down into the fact that two is not just, oh, well, because it's two, I need to divide by two. You need to think of it as, well, each one has a weight of one. That is then the, the next step to us understanding how weighted averages work, right? So if we move over to this example where I've done a weighted average, I'm same, doing the same thing, sampling the positions, right? But then I give each one a weight. And of course, by default, I'm giving those each a weight of one. And then the algorithm becomes, it's the same thing, but we've just kind of extrapolated it a little bit, right? Our first one, instead of just P1, it's P1 multiplied by its own weight. So weight one. And P2 is multiplied by weight two. And then we add those two together. And I've wrapped the whole thing in um, brackets to make sure that this addition happens before the division, right? So we are just calculating whatever's on the top of the divide sign, right? It, which is P1 plus P, P2. But the thing is we need to multiply each of them by their weights, which is a weight of one. Now that is already what's actually happening in our weighted average. You don't see it because something multiplied by one is just itself, right? But really this is actually P1 times one plus P2 times one, and then divided by one plus one, because those are the two different weights. So now here we also add our two weights together and then we divide the whole, you know, P1 times W1 plus P2 times W2, divided by both of the weights added together. Which in this case, if they're both one, gives us the exact same result. So you can see here, I switch my display back and forward, nothing changes. But of course, now I can change the weights. So if W1 was two, then essentially it's, we're taking that position, multiplying it by two, then taking this position multiplied by one, adding them together and then dividing by three this time because it's two plus one, right? So because this was multiplied by two, but divided by three versus this being multiplied by one, but divided by three, this value becomes much less and this value is higher so that it has the highest proportion of sort of, of weight in that sum, okay? It, basically this one is two thirds more influencing you know like like influential on the final result okay so it ends up being one third of the way uh, towards that point and two thirds further away from p2 okay so this has an increased weight and you'll see as i drag that slider it gets closer and closer and closer to p1 the thing is it will never actually no matter how far we take it it's never actually going to get all the way to exactly the same position as p1 it looks like it is but it's really not because um, this has a weight, there is W2. So the, um, this position is mixed in there somewhere, but it's a very, very, very small amount, okay? And now likewise, you could increase W2 and it goes towards W2, but you can also decrease W2 and it goes back towards W1 or position one, okay? Also important to note that if they both have high values, like e but equally high values, then it goes exactly in the middle. So there's no difference between them having a weight of one each or a weight of 10,000 each. Okay, so this is how a weighted average works. What is happening inside of a pull is current velocity has a weight of one. Okay, so imagine Current velocity is P1, and we give it a default weight of one. And then W2 is our, our weight that we have control over. So that, in fact, that's even how the wind force is working, right? Like there's some extra things that are happening with wind force in terms of different winds adding together. We can talk about that another time, but really with one wind force, like our pop it vector by volumes, when we were increasing that air resist, if air resist is set to one, what it means is blend 50-50 with my current velocity and the target, okay? So when the next time you're doing pop it vect and you're wondering, well, these seem like arbitrary values, this air resist, you know, why is it one? What, or, you know, what, should I set it to 10? Should I set it to 100? What does this mean? You know, 100 out of what? 
well it's it's not really out of anything because it's it's sort of the higher it gets the more weight it pulls towards itself um, so that number there is simply just controlling this number here so 10 would mean it is you know much more in fact actually let's set it to 9 would mean it is 90% taking this value and only 10% taking that value because obviously 9 plus 1 would be 10 so those added together basically it's taking p2 multiplied by 9 p1 multiplied by 1 adding them together and then dividing by 10 so obviously the majority of the value that you're going to be get as a result is p2 okay not exactly 90 percent of it in this case so really air resist is just saying current velocity has a weight of one and now i'm giving you control over one weight right which is the target weight pull is basically taking this one step further separating this weight with an if statement basically saying is the target faster than or slower than me and in which case and when i say me i mean the current velocity in which case it then um, treats it with two different weighted values okay that's all it's doing and then one step further it gives you the option of separating direction and magnitude of a vector but that is just a simple fact of if you take a vector and you normalize it you get the direction and then if you take the length of it you get the speed so we separate those two, we give it two separate weights, and then we multiply them again at the end. Direction multiplied by the magnitude, and it gives you the result. So it's the exact same concept, just separated into two different weighted averages using you know, that, that other weight. Okay, Because you get that third weight, which is direction. So we're building on the same concept, but simply separating acceleration deceleration and direction but a direction has an optional separation so we need to build a toggle for that as well and that is it that is how you build a pull function and because we can do that then i'm going to show you exactly how uh, how powerful that is and what else you can build into it all right so let's build this together all right i have some versions here where i'm going to show you some customizations i've done to it so i've already built that but I want to actually go with you step by step and show you how easy this is. So we're going to build it together, the, at least the first one. Okay. And then from there, I'm just going to show you some cool things you can do with it. And then you are now empowered to make magic. Okay. So let's call this our pull uh, force, right? So I'm using a pop wrangle here. You could also use a geometry wrangle. And of course, if we are in uh, applying this to pyro, you would use a gas wrangle instead. Okay, we need to refer to our um, second context geometry, which I'm going to use input two for that. So that if I use the, a value of one for our my geometry handle, that it'll it'll fetch that second input. Okay. So very simply, what we need to do is we need to sample. Now I'm going to leave notes as I go to make this very easy. So um, I'm going to put. Our, our, we first we sample the values in fact let's take one look one more look at this before we move on you see here I grab the values I then set the weights and then I write out the result so I calculate the average and then write it that is the basic sort of steps we're going to take here it's just a little more complicated because we're doing some separation all right so I'm going to create a vector called um, sample and this is going to be my target velocity. You could call it whatever you want. I always just call it sample. And volume sample V is the function we're going to use. Um, that's because it's a vector field that we are sampling. All right. If you ever wanted to build a pull, but it is a float, like a scalar field, then of course you just um, do volume sample. One is our um, geometry that we're looking at. Then we're fetching V. Obviously, you need to be careful that that field is named correctly. If you call it something different and then copy this code it's not going to work and then we're sampling it at the position v at p okay um, something i'm going to build in quickly as well is just a little multiplier for this so i'm going to call this scale uh, force because i want the option of scaling it's very similar in our volume source here when we did the pull function it had an option for um, scaling source scale here okay 
So I want that option um, because we're setting the force outside. Once it's inside, I want to be able to kind of just multiply that and get a little bit more control over that. Okay. I'll set it to one by default, but of course we can in increase that if we want to. Okay. And then uh, you don't have to, but if you want to, you could store the um, current velocity as um, a, a uh, variable if you want, instead of constantly referring to the sort of binding it in. Um, that can help if you want to copy this code from points to uh, volumes or back and forward, then you only have to change this in one place. V at vel is obviously what you're going to want to use to sample the current velocity in a volume, but V at V would usually be what's on your particles. So storing this in a variable and then referring to the variable means that most of the code stays the same and you only have to reword it in one place place. You could also even reword this by leaving it as V, but then changing your um, data bindings as well. So you could actually bind in and say that uh, V should actually be VEL instead. And then of course that would work. All right. So we basically sample our two values. That's the same as grabbing our two point positions. We've just grabbed a uh, sample of a vector field value and then bind in our current velocity. All right. Then what we need to do is calculate our speeds. So we need speed and direction. How you get speed is you take the length of a vector. So we will now call this float. Um, and I'm just going to call it speed one, which is I'm going to treat one. In fact, even I will reorder this. I'm going to put so I'm always going to treat one is going to refer to my current velocity and two is my target, right? Because usually even target, you plug it in your second. It just kind of makes more sense to me that one is current and two is target. And I will always put things in that order as well. So it's our first one and then our second one. Okay. So speed one is going to be length of V, right? Uh, the variable, not the uh, bind in. Okay. Then speed two is going to be the length of sample, right? Very simple. We need our directions. Now for direction, we need to normalize. So these will be vectors still. So vector and then dir1 is going to be normalize uh, v. And then vector dir2 is going to be normalize sample. OK. Now we need to calculate our weights. Float w1 is by default one and we're going to leave it at one of course there are things you could do then if you really wanted to you could alter the weight of one which is a again a reason why doing it in vex is much better in pop at vec by volumes in volume source you can't change the base weight you can only change the target weight here you can if you want to usually you don't but if you wanted to you could right um so we've got w1 and then float W2. Now with W2, it gets a little more complicated because we've separated it. So what I do is I give it a default of zero because if I, I, I want it to sort of not have any influence unless I then give it a weight that overrides that. So we'll uh, initialize it as zero, but then we're going to say if, and then we would basically say speed one. So if my current value speed one is less than the incoming, so the target velocity speed two, then I am accelerating, right? Or at least what you do, you're asking me to do to match the target velocity is to accelerate. Okay. So therefore I will override W2 with a parameter and we're going to call this acceleration. Okay. If the speed one is greater than speed two. In other words, to match it, you're asking me to decelerate, then I'm going to override this with deceleration. Um, you could also do it as else. Um, and you can, if you want to, you can play around with the greater than equals or less than equals or whatever. So you can, but in this case, what it's doing is if they're exactly the same, then the default will be zero. And if they're exactly the same, then why do any blending? It's the same. So it, in this case, it doesn't really matter. And to me, visually, this is the clearest because it's it's saying exactly whether it's accelerating or decelerating. Okay. So there's several ways you could do this, but this is one way I like it um, to be 
you know, it makes visual sense. And now we have our acceleration and our deceleration values, right? Next, we need our third weight, which is for direction. Now, instead of getting complicated and having two different algorithms at the end, depending on whether we have a third weight or not, I'm just going to always assume there is a direction weight. But by default, I'm going to set this direction weight. So I'm going to call it W3. Um, or sometimes I even, to avoid confusion, I, I will call it W dir or something like that, um, just to make it clear that this is the, um, it's not a, weight, a third weight for a third different vector that I'm uh, looking at. It is a specifically the direction component of W2. So, I mean, we could even do that. We could call it W2 dir or whatever. So it's up to you. But uh, it, when I'm doing a basic version, I just call it W3, so it's fine. And by default, I'm going to say to W3 to be equal to W2. This is because basically if use direction is turned off, like here on our volume sample, we said if uh, this direction strength is off, okay, uh, it will always be off if that's set to scalar. If this is off, then these influence speed and direction. So I'm just going to use whatever W2 is, which W2 has already been set to be either acceleration or deceleration, depending on the target velocity being faster or slower than the current velocity. So that has already been factored in. So I can just simply set W3 to be equal to whatever W2 is, and it will treat it as though those two are merged together, direction and speed, okay? But now I can override it if our toggle is turned on. So we then basically say if channel int and then use dir. And then we say w3 instead is equal to our direction parameter. All right, and then we get these two. Now, of course, I can, uh, if I really want to be nice and neat, I can come in here, turn the label off, uh, make it a toggle, horizontally join to next parameter. And then even on here, tell this to disable when use direction is equal to zero. Okay, and what that does is it gives us exactly this kind of look. So we're able to to toggle it on and then it um, comes on. If it's off, it disables it. And yeah, that's exactly how it works on here. So that um, I'm quite happy about. I know that here they call it uh, acceleration strength and whatever, but yeah, I think this is neater. Okay, so now we have our weights. So all we need to do is essentially calculate our, our vectors, well, our uh, float and our vector, and then of course we're going to uh, combine them. So let's do our speed first. So I'm just gonna call this speed, since these were speed one, speed two, those are our separate components, but at the end, speed is my final resulting speed, okay? Um, so we need to do our calculation, which we know is, you know, two things, so something divided by something. It's our basically all our values multiplied by their weights added together and then divided by all the weights combined, okay? So inside of here, for however many vectors I have, in this case, we're doing a simple one, so it's two. Um, so I, we take our speed one multiplied by weight one, which we know weight one is gonna be one, but it's important to write out the full thing. Okay, we don't, obviously we could leave it out because we know it's multiplied by one, but then later if we decide to change weight one, then it doesn't, you know, it doesn't actually work. And then we're adding that to the other value multiplied by its weight. So speed two multiplied by W2. And then all of that is divided by W1 plus W2. Okay, very similarly, our um, direction is going to be the vectors divided by the weights. The vectors are, so the first one is dir1 times w1. Now you'll see I don't have a separate weight for the direction component of, of number one. If we did one, two, of course we could do that. So then we would do something like we'd call it w1 dir, and then instead of um, weight three, W3, I'd call it W2 dir, which is another way of doing this, okay? And again, here I would set this to a default of one. Um, so you could do that if you wanted to to kind of be more clear. In fact, maybe let's do that. Let's, um, 
let's not make it confusing. So W1 and W1 dir, and then W2 and W2 dir. In fact, what we do is actually set that to W1. Okay. Um, all right. And then we add our second, oh, okay, so this would be W1 dir, which again is still just one, but it's, it's good to have it written out properly so we can understand it. And then this would be dir2 multiplied by W2, but the direction weight rather than the, the normal weight, okay? And then we add those two together. So W1 direction plus W2 direction weight, okay? Now the result here will not necessarily be normalized uh, because it's taking two normalized vectors, but then multiplying them and then dividing. So it's averaging between them, which means if it goes at a halfway between and both were normalized, that vector in the middle is going to be shorter than the value of one. So I am going to normalize this. Um, well, sometimes I like to normalize it just in its own step, but actually the easiest way really is when we um, do the final results. So let's, um, I'll call this out. So we're gonna write this out, write out our result, which is gonna be overriding whatever the the vector is so in our case it's v but of course if it was val um, then you'd like so if you're using this on volumes then you'd be binding out to the val field right and then you'd override it so this is not adding or anything you are overriding because you are taking current velocity and you're factoring that in so you need to override it with the whole value that we've calculated okay so v at v equals and then we basically take the vector multiplied by the speed but in our case, I'm going to normalize the direction vector again to make sure that it is definitely normalized and then multiply by the speed. Okay, and that is it. Okay, um, just make sure everything is promoted. By the way, this little pop-up happens when you have altered something. So like, you know, all those changes I made swapping the type. So I could replace, but I just say, uh, don't do it. All right. So obviously this does nothing, but that's exactly right. That's what we wanted it to do because it's multiplying it by one, which is itself, and it's got zero weight coming in, so nothing will happen. However, if I now go and turn on, let's just turn on direction, then it alters that, right? Now that's direction without deceleration. So of course it falls at normal speed and then it goes around the curve, great. Okay, that's what we could get using a poppet. Um, well, no, see, we couldn't do it with poppet vector volumes, but this is the pop version of a volume source with set to pull. Okay, so we can get rid of that now. Obviously, if we had deceleration, then it would slow it down outside. So we still have that problem, right? We still get the exact same results that um, our poppet vector volumes gave us, although we do have the option of not using that and only using direction. So it's better but it's not perfect but the, what's what is perfect is the fact that this is now written out so we can add anything we want to in here so simply add a line add more conditions right this is great so that's my normal pull force my like my basic but let's look at some of the custom things we can do to it so here i've got a version where i've done exactly the same thing you'll see this looks identical except for this one section that's it Everything else is the same, although obviously here I actually just called it W3 um, rather than W2 dir. Anyway, this is the only section where I added anything. And what I added was a minimum threshold because I want to be able to use my deceleration saying, if my target value genuinely is lower than your current value, then I want you to decelerate. I want you to obey its limitation in speed. But if you're outside and you're sampling a zero value, then no, I don't want you to decelerate down to zero. Of course, I don't want that. So we're essentially creating a custom mask here, but sort of just on the fly rather than having to load in a separate um, field. So we can set a minimum threshold for, this, uh, for the speed of our target velocity. So anything that's got speed less than 0 0.01 is gonna be ignored. But anything with speed of that or greater will then say, oh, okay, so you're clearly not a, of zero value that's outside of the field or even within the field but maybe a deactivated voxel no you are actually a value that is worth considering and you are slow 
So therefore I should look at the deceleration value and say, okay, if, if the user wants it to decelerate, then I should. So we plug this in. So it's all the exact same controls here, except I've got this minimum threshold. And you'll see there at now, they drop at full speed because they're ignoring all those zero values. Then they hit this curve and the curve is slow. So they slow down and they follow the curve. And then at the end, they drop off because they've exited the field. They're now finding zero values. The zero values are ignored. So the weight is zero. And if you've got your second weight is zero and your first weight is one, of course, it just 100% takes what the current velocity is, which means that the gravity is able to take effect. And we basically have automatic masking going on here. Okay. And we could play with the minimum threshold. What's really cool is that this threshold could be anything. I'm using speed here, but you could do, uh, you could use age. So now your particles based on age would then get a weight rather than, um, you know, so maybe very, very young particles ignore any kind of force. And only once they're older than a certain amount, they get that force. There's so many things you could do. Something I did is a more complicated threshold. So that's, I've got another version here where I kept the same thing. I kept the same minimum threshold custom code, but I added one, uh, these two sections really, one where I'm accumulating a value whenever it is within a certain distance of our collision object. So I'm pointing to the collision object using an XYZ dist function to get the distance to that object. And then basically saying, if you are within a certain distance of it, right, I'm just going to start accumulating that sort of fitted distance. And so it's just adding, but then based on that value that keeps increasing, I then set a mask uh, value. Uh, it's not even writing to the points. I'm just calculating this as a variable that basically says if that value is between zero and then a certain amount, I fade in our our weight. So this will then basically say ignore this force until you have been in contact with the collision object for enough frames. Okay, and uh, here's the result. So that drops. But only the points that hit the collider and basically were slowed down by the collider enough to remain in the in the proximity of the collider for a certain time are getting influenced by the force. Everything else is just dropping straight off. I don't know when you'd want to do this, but you can. And it all it took was that same code plus a couple of lines added in and that's it, you know. So this is incredible. This it is all the power you would want from a pull function. You can apply it to points, you can apply it to volumes. It's It just gives you everything you want, right? Um, let's go over and talk about the volumes. Here I've got that basic pull uh, coded in, just exactly the same, but just looking at vel instead of v, and it works, right? This over here is controlling direction only, because this still has the problem of um, not having that minimum threshold. So if we set deceleration, of course, it's going to influence our um, our gravity, and that's not what we wanted. In this case, uh, the force, particularly with the volumes, because it's being disrupted by divergence and by its own sort of internal drag and um, uh, turbulence, I increased the scale force uh, to multiply by three, right? So it kind of follows around our, our curve over here. Now, uh, we can also set our minimum threshold version of this. Uh, let's, why is that not? All right. So then here's our minimum threshold version. So now we're able to actually influence the speed and slow the voxels down when they're inside of that curve because they are ignored when they're outside of the, the field, you know. So that gives us even better results. But something that I don't really like, especially with volumes, is you get this very smooth, streaky look when you over control your velocity of your fields because your um, you know, density needs to move in a way that is natural. It moves forward, but while it's moving forward, it's also expanding based on the density. So that's your divergence. And it, you know, it rolls and it has this kind of drag and it's got turbulence. And if we just crush all of that and overwhelm it with just direction force, uh, it doesn't look 
great. Um, maybe that's the look you want. You want that thin look. Then you know maybe the the wizard is pulling some smoke out, and you want it to be this thin, almost perfect volume. Then cool, you can do it. But personally, I think it looks a little too CG, right? So this is now something really fun that we can do. And in fact, I actually used this is what I basically did on on Avatar was um, how to control those like um, you know Avatar Lost Airbender, not the blue people. Um, is how do all the bending and stuff was done basically using custom pull function, but particularly um, for the fire bending, I was doing all of this where I create a tone uh, 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 cone of tolerance, right? It's the opposite of a cone of shame, um, right? So it's the tolerance cone. In other words, it's a d degree of angle based on dot product that we are saying, hey, let's take the weight and re reduce it. Um, and you can use this in several ways. You know, the way I'm using it here is basically saying if your direction is very different to the direction I want you to be going, then of course I want to apply a, a strong influence. But as soon as you're going vaguely in the right direction, then I don't want to control you as much. I'm gonna I'm gonna reduce. You know, it's it's sort of like a uh, like a father pushing you know, helping a kid ride a bike. But once they're actually pedaling and they're kind of going, you you want to sort of let go. You don't want to just hold them the whole time and control them, right? You want to give them a chance. But it's when they are falling or doing something completely wrong that you then grab them, right? So this is sort of what it's doing. So this, um, this ramp here is essentially going, so between 0 and 0 0.5, that is the angles facing the complete opposite direction. And at 0 0.5, that is tangent. So I want you to be traveling you know, along x and you're traveling on along y. So you're 90 degrees to me. You'd get a dot product value of 0. And then all the way between 0 0.5 to 1 is it traveling in the same direction, so the correct direction. So I'm basically influencing it all the way up to it reaches about this point and then starting to drop off the level of influence saying, okay, you're, you're mostly going in the right direction. So I'm actually going to back off and let you do whatever you want. Right. And this is how we then maintain some natural divergence and turbulence and things because we push in the right direction. But then once they're heading in the right direction, we kind of let them keep moving that way. And then as they start diverging too much, we, we nudge them back in the right way. Okay. So then you get much more natural look, but you're still able to influence it to flow around in that direction. And like I said, this was really instrumental in the fire bending. Something else you could do with this is you could have it be, um, you could make it that it only influences when it is going roughly in the right direction, but ones that are completely going the opposite direction, then just ignore them. So you're taking, you're sort of, you're taking ones that are that seem to be heading in that direction and using their force already and sort of just nudging them and guiding them. But the ones that are going the opposite direction, yeah, just ignore them. Um, and this can be very powerful on points rather than on volume. In volumes, obviously, there's a lot of interpolation and mixing of these values inside. So things going in opposite directions from one another are going to end up causing, you know, some weird results. But with points, you could have literally some points moving one direction and some points moving the opposite direction straight through one another. And you are essentially using this ramp to mask between these two sets of points based on their dot product value. Okay, so it's almost like a dynamic grouping. And it's not even a group like it's Boolean, like they're in or out. It's you can ramp up the influence. So ones that are going tangential will slowly be influenced to turn around and go in the right direction. But those that are going the opposite completely or just ignored right so many cool things you can do with this and it's really it's powerful on volumes it's powerful on points uh, it gives you total control and the thing is you could save this node right you could save this code and just copy it in you know maybe save this as a tool and you can drop it and then copy the code and or, or alter it or just store this in a I don't know a notepad somewhere and you copy the code in and then you alter it um, so it gives you you know, you don't have to write this up every time. Uh, in our uh, disintegration, sorry, not disintegration, in the bubble bomb workshop that we're doing for film effects, we are doing even a three way um, pull. So we've got two target velocities and we give them each their own individual weight, including separating acceleration, deceleration, direction. So the code gets obviously a little bit more, uh, more complicated 
well, just in terms of more lines of code, but actually it's still so simple. So I hope by showing you this technique that it has really helped you. I hope that I've convinced you of the power of VEX and why I always seem to write VEX instead of using the nodes. I mean, I even for like a, like a Ray node, I've never used Ray. I just use an XYZ dist or a, an intersect function. But the reason why is because midway through that you decide oh i just want to actually influence only some points but you know but not just in a group but rather oh some points need to be um, modulated and, and influenced less than others based on a certain attribute or condition but you can easily add that line if you're doing it in uh, with a ray node then you can't so now you have to then go okay well i was using ray but now i have to switch over to vex so then you have to take the time to rewrite it it's i just do everything in vex and then you can just add lines so i hope i'm convincing some people to get way more into vex but even if not this one particular use case should be a good thing for you to at least store and copy and then just alter whenever you need to because this gives you the degree of control over particles and volumes that you need and essentially to make magic it's basically control and then how it's rendered you know so making it glow and all of that type of stuff but really at its base magic is just control okay so i hope that's helpful to you and um yeah uh, i really want to see what you guys use this on so if you do anything really cool with this please post it tag me like let's uh let's actually see what awesome things we can do with this this magic cool see you guys mm -hmm.